What does it mean to embed one compact Lie group into another? What could be the philosophical significance of that with regard to the meaning of life? Or perhaps you're interested just to gain more intuition about this. I'm sharing why I'm investigating this, uh, what I'm learning along the way, and uh, what I'd like to tell those who are following me, walking with me on this journey. I am Andres Kolikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. So I'm studying uh, bot periodicity. I'm trying to make sense of it. Uh, and uh, that most concretely involves embeddings of Lie groups. The Lie groups involved, uh, they're compact, uh, and they're called the orthogonal group, O-N, the unitary group, U-N, and the compact symplectic group, S-P-N, where N is the number of dimensions of um, a vector space that uh, N by N matrices are acting on. So these are groups of matrices. Uh, group means that it's a system of actions. So there's... Uh, just a few axioms for what that means. Uh, you have a do-nothing action, which is called the identity. Uh, for any action, you can undo it, so it has an inverse. And uh, if you have one action and another, you can compose them, and that'll give you a third action. And uh, that uh, composition is associative, so that means the parentheses shouldn't matter. Like if you do action A uh, on B, and then do C, uh, that should be the same as if you have action B on action C and precede that by action A. So that's a group. Uh, but a Lie group is also a manifold. It's a, uh, it's, I guess it's a, this would get tec too technical for me, but basically it's a smooth space uh, that could be multidimensional, but it's got this continuity and it's got a differentiability, which basically means that if you ever so slightly move in one direction or another direction, uh, you're part of that um, space. So an example would be a circle, you know, that you can rotate it as little or as much as you want, and that's uh, rotation in the circle. So the set of rotations, or you could be rotating a sphere, or um, what's also interesting, perhaps you could be uh, reflecting this circle or reflecting the sphere, inverting them, okay? Uh, there's not that much you can do with a sphere to keep it a sphere, uh, to have the, uh, to, to manifest that symmetry, those transformations, and those transformations form very important uh, Lie groups. And uh, these ones would be called compact Lie groups. Uh, something that's not compact would be something that just goes off into infinity. So, for example, like the real line, you can have addition on the real line. Uh, you could uh, even have a multipl multipl multiplicative, I guess, uh, relation on the real line. But the, the deal is, is that if you had a s infinite sequence, it just could keep walking off and off the page, you know, off and off into infinity. Whereas a compact one would say, no, it's basically closed and bounded in a certain sense, intuitively, so that if you have a sequence walking on it, that sequence, if it's infinite, is just going to run out of places to hide, places to go, and it's going to have to converge somewhere. Okay, it'll have a little hiding spot, a home, you know, if it's uh, if it's uh, compact. I have to be careful what I'm saying. But anyways, that kind of gives you the intuitive difference. So, there's um, three, there really aren't that many types of uh, Lie groups. Uh, they've been classified uh, famously. Um, and because they're just so symmetric and so restrictive, there's just not that many possibilities, which is interesting then cognitively. Like, is that revealing something about our cognitive limitations, our, the limitations on our imagination? And uh, so one related theorem I think by Frobenius is um, that, uh, or I have to be careful about that, uh, that there's three normed division algebras. 
Okay, so if you have an algebraic system where you have addition and multiplication and that they both have inverses, uh, let's see. Yeah, that's a division algebra. You'd want to be able to do division. So then in that case, um, uh, if you have a norm, a notion of length, right, and a notion of perpendicularity and distance that comes along with that, an inner product, so to speak, a notion of angles, uh, when you have this type of... Um, notion of a norm that could uh, ground a geometry, then you don't have a lot of possibilities for those division algebras. It could either be the real numbers or the complex numbers uh, or the quaternions or the octonians, but the octonians aren't associative. So that's often not considered. Uh, the quaternions, they're not commutative. So uh, I times J equals negative J times I. That's called uh, anti-commutative, okay? So you can't just swap. The order matters. Uh, so that's uh, important to keep in mind with the quaternions. And then you have the complex numbers uh, and you have the real numbers. So you can think of lengths in each of those cases. You can think of inner products, which basically set up well, what a length is because a length is a vector's inner, uh, inner product with itself. As you take the square root. Um, so you have these three uh, things. And so the orthogonal groups would be um, the orthogonal matrices uh, that preserve the inner product uh, for vectors if they're written out in real numbers. And the unitary group would consist of unitary matrices where the numbers are complex. And the complex symplectic uh, group would um, be... Um, and there probably isn't such a thing as compact symplectic matrix, but there's a group of, of the matrices which preserve uh, uh, the um, standard Hermitian form, which I think is basically like the inner product, on these vectors of quaternions, okay? So that's just a way to briefly introduce uh, the groups that I'm talking about, these manifolds that I'm talking about. And then as manifolds, they can sit within each other. They can be embedded. Uh, so you can have, let's say, and I'll use, let's say, the number 2n, okay? So one of the things uh, I'm trying to explain today is that if you have uh, unitary matrices, which are 2n times 2n, so n could be 100, so it's 200 times 200, right? Then inside of that, you can have a subgroup, which would be un cross un, Okay. And what does that look like? A little bit uh, to give a clue about that. And why would we care? Well, one of the things uh, that I'm studying is uh, bot periodicity. And a way that that manifests itself, which is quite concrete, is in terms of these Lie group embeddings. And there's two flavors, or there's two versions. Uh, one is uh, this short periodicity, which uh, is called length two. And it just says, if you have a unitary matrix, let's say u of 2r, where r could be any uh, positive integer. Then inside there, there would be a subgroup ur cross ur, okay? And then inside there, uh, you have a diagonal subgroup, which is just ur. And then you could continue, okay? If, if, if your r is even, you could just continue doing this uh, so long as you have even numbers. Uh, so that's, uh, it'll be quite... Um, that's straightforward, that's believable. But then there is a very uh, peculiar eightfold periodicity, which involves all three of these, where you're kind of basically mentally switching from real numbers to complex numbers to quaternions and back. And so uh, you should multiply by 16, um, uh, whatever your dimension is going to be. And you start with the orthogonal. And then embedded in there is the unitary. Uh, and that'll be... Uh, these matrices will have uh, half the dimension. But really, you can think of it as a subgroup, in which case the unitary would be dealing with complex numbers, acting on complex numbers. Uh, so uh, there are no complex numbers when you have real entries. So but what you do is you um, block this up into two by two matrices. And if you've seen, like, you can um, take the complex number i and if you look at this two by two matrix here, zero minus one, one, zero, it functions very much like I, 
would function if it multiplied on a vector uh, a b then it would have the effect of uh, getting you what would happen if you multiplied uh, a plus b i times the number i the complex imaginary number i so then you could say okay so you would say this is isomorphic in here there's an isomorphic copy of uh, u of a r you know so it's just a little bit about naming a little bit about uh, just uh, switching namespaces. Uh, so, but then you can go deeper inside here. There's going to be a, a sub um, group uh, that's the complex symplectic group, and you you again block it up. Then in here, uh, you have this embedding where this will split into two parts, and then you'll take the diagonal. That's an embedding, and then you uh, will say, okay, but now. Uh, this is the uh, quaternion, but I can say in here, okay, I want to look at the uh, unitary um, uh, Lie group in here of these dimensions and or uh, orthogonal group of this dimension, and then that'll split, and then that will be taken the diagonal group, and you get back to where you started in a sense, okay? So this is an eightfold process. Now, for me, what I'm trying to model now, and this has application in condensed matter physics, uh, where it's running through different types of uh, symmetric spaces that you can have. Uh, when you quotient these, uh, if you if you if you take this space and you have this subspace and you do a quotient space, which is basically kind of saying like you collapse this space as if it was just a single point. And then you you move around uh, the, the 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 quotient would be like what's left over basically like the remainder so to speak so that would be a symmetric space and that's uh that's considered um, uh, in physics as uh, giving you all the Hamiltonians, or like the Hamiltonians multiplied by the complex number i, but basically these, what are like these evolution operators, like all the possible choices for how your system evolved, they, they inhabit this space where you can make slight differences, it's continuous or whatever, so this is multidimensional space, but there aren't very many of these multidimensional spaces. Um, and so um, there would be um, symmetries that determine the types of spaces you could have, depending on which symmetries you have. These would be like time reversal. Like, so or do things look the same if you're traveling forwards or traveling backwards? If you switch the direction time, does it affect anything? If you're, um, you can have particles and holes. And so that would be considered like even parts of the space, odd parts of the space. So philosophically, like if something is, or if it's missing, is it the same? You know, like I, an electron, is it the same as a hole in a sea of positrons? Okay, just a missing positron, is that the same as an electron? It depends actually on what you're assuming. And so there aren't that many ways uh, to assume things and those are the assumptions and those are walked through here. Now, philosophically, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say that those are mental spaces. Okay, like how we, if we think very abstractly and we ignore all our experience and we ignore all the concepts we know and we just look at how those fit together, we're kind of carving up this void, this like into things like free will versus fate or into things like a learning cycle where you take a stand and follow through and reflect or in terms of levels of knowledge, like whether, what, how, why. There's these very abstract structures. So I'm trying to argue that this is basically mapping that out. So we have to kind of understand bits and pieces of it. So that's enough for motivation. But to generate these, um, you need uh, what's called a linear complex structure J. Okay, And so I kind of mentioned, you can think of this as an imaginary number I, but it's just in a two by two matrix form. And so let's say you had a diagonal matrix made up of blocks, a block diagonal matrix where you had these blocks and they're all basically I just as written out in terms of two by two real matrices. And then what it turns out that um, this, uh, if you look at the operator I times something like this, you know, the, the scalar I, then if you take this space U of two R and you say, okay, this is a bunch of matrices, but suppose I look at which of those matrices commute with I times this J. Okay, and commute means you can write it out like that. Uh, well, here, these anti-commute, let's say. So 
IJ1 times IJ2 is negative IJ2, IJ1. But see, if you didn't have the negative sign, then they would commute. The numbers we're used to commute, like 5 times 7 is 7 times 5. Uh, complex numbers commute. But once you get to the quaternions, you have I, J, K, and you have this thing, I times J is not equal to J times I. It's equal to negative J times I. That's called anti-commuting. Uh, so you can commute, you can anti-commute, or then you just can simply have <laughs> bigger problems than that. But um, so what we're going to do is what's left over. Okay, and so if you allow for this I, which means you allow for a complex scalar, then you can uh, get this right away, okay? So that this is what survives. And if you do that with a mutually anti-commuting one, then, then it'll be the, the next one that survives. So IJ2. But if you, um, if you have uh, just simply J1, J2, J, you know, all the way up to however many Js you, you like, then that's what's happening here. You apply a J1 that looks like this and whatever basis uh, that makes it look pretty like that. Because, you know, if you write it in a different basis, it's not going to look so pretty as this is or so simple. It'll look more. If you thought this is a little bit complicated, it's going to look just all over the place. So you have to find the nice basis. And so then just for sake of calculation. And then... Um, then um, what will commute with this will be these unitary matrices. Um, then if you do it again, but with a second uh, J2, let's say, which in its own basis would look like that, but in some other basis would look different. But And so there could be actually many Js out there, and some of them could be uh, anti-commuting with each other. So then if you do both of them, then you get this one. If you do a third one, you get uh, this one. So what I'm claiming philosophically is I think that the J1, J2, J3 are like introspected uh, mental perspectives. So you're carving up the space with two of them or three of them or four of them. That's what I'm trying to understand. But there's something special that happens if you use three of them. And that's the that's the punchline for today. We'll, we'll, come, up, we'll come up with that. So let's get to the math. Um, when we have an operator, k squared equals the identity matrix, and it acts on this vector space V, then our vector space splits into two parts, into V plus and V minus. So I'll explain what I'm talking about there. Uh, and so where do we get this operator from? Uh, well, we have to define it. Um, now, we want it to square to identity. The J that I showed here, that squares to negative one for the same reasons that like, you know, if you multiply this out, you'll get it equals to negative one. Um, uh, you can even see like th this row times this column right here, uh, z it'll give you negative one. Zero times zero, zero, negative one times one is negative one. This row times this column, that'll give you zero. This row times this column, that'll give you zero. And this row times this column will give you negative one. So you ended up with negative ones on the diagonal, and that'll just happen all the way down. That'll be negative the identity. But we want the identity. Why? Okay. Well, let's first find one that'll give us the identity if we square it. If you put this scalar here, i, j, one, well, what does that mean? That just means that we're multiplying this whole thing by i. So it could be zero minus i, i, zero on all the blocks. Okay. So... If you square that, well, those are commutative. Um, the scalar is commutative, and so things commute with themselves. So you get i squared times j1 squared. Well, that's negative 1, and that's negative 1, and together they're positive 1. So you have this operator, k equals ij1, and it satisfies, it squares to identity. But that you can also say, well, it satisfies the equation k squared minus identity equals 0. Okay? And now here's a trick I learned. And also a mistake I made, uh, you know, in a certain sense, you can factor this. Okay, so k squared minus identity equals k minus identity times k plus identity. But that doesn't mean that k is one or the other. And it doesn't mean that, um, you know, with matrices aren't numbers, basically, that's the issue. Matrices are more sophisticated. And so... Um, 
matrices, uh, just because a matrix um, satisfies this, it doesn't force it to satisfy one or the other. But a matrix has eigenvalues, and that's what we're going to look at. And see, eigenvalues are numbers, and eigenvalues, when you plug them into uh, polynomials like this, then those polynomials, if they satisfy the polynomials, although the polynomials are going to be factoring, and so the eigenvalues will be one of those possibilities. So let's say that uh, lambda, this is a number, it's an eigenvalue of k with eigenvector v. v. So what that means, it means that um, when k acts on v, v is so special with regards to k that k isn't able to knock it out of its uh, dimension. That, that vector is defining some kind of uh, dimension. And so when k acts on it, it, it can only change its size, it's maybe flip it to negative. But that's a line or that's a vector that's not going to be affected uh, by this, except for maybe changing the size of that vector. It's not going to throw it. Whereas typically a vector would be rotated in some way you know, into, into becoming a combination of other vectors. But this will just be a combination of itself. And so that is very interesting because it's helping us to understand uh, how this matrix wants to be understood. Like, what is the natural basis for this matrix? Uh, it would be given by these eigenvectors because they help you. Because and then if you can write it out in terms of eigenvectors, then the matrix is just basically acting as a diagonal. Okay. So we have this. Uh, now, if uh, lambda, uh, okay, so kv equals lambda v. So if we start with v, well, from this equation, we know that v equals k squared v, because k squared is just the identity. But k squared, that's like k acting on k acting on v. Well, that would be lambda times lambda times v. And then you go back and say, well, if v equals lambda squared v, now we're dealing with numbers. And so you can solve that. So lambda squared equals 1. So lambda equals plus or minus 1. There's those two possibilities. And so what that means, it means that uh, this is uh, all the um, possible um, eigenvalues of k. And uh, does it uh, manifest all of these? That's a question. Um, so we know these are the possible ones. Uh, does, it, uh, does it actually manifest this? Well, and we're, I guess, maybe not, except on the, let's say, the zero. See, of course, if V is the zero vector, then that'll always be, you can do whatever you want, basically. So we don't, I don't think we have a guarantee that uh, you're going to be able to, um, uh, you're going to be able to have uh, non-zero vectors where this will be the case. But you do know these are the only possible ones uh, for non-zero vectors. And you do know that you can split the vector space V into a V plus and V minus, where one of these could possibly be the null space, like the, you know, just the zero number, right? So one of these basically could be almost empty just with the zero. Um, so, uh, but it will split up, okay? In which case the other one will be the whole thing. And so um, what does V plus mean? It means that... Uh, if you're a vector in V plus, then KV equals V. So the eigenvalue is positive one. And if you're a vector in V minus, then KV equals minus V. So negative one is the eigenvalue. And now, suppose, um, okay, so this is what I was trying to, this is the whole point of today's uh, little conversation between us, that uh, when you have this operator, K squared equals one, it's going to split the vector space. Okay, and now what's that going to say about the uh, embedding of these Lie groups? Okay, well, suppose that A is a matrix in this uh, unitary group, okay, of 2n by 2n matrices. And just, just uh, to make life kind of more concrete and maybe easy for us, uh, we're going to take V plus and V minus to both be n-dimensional, although that's not going to really affect this argument. Uh, so what can we conclude if i, j, and a commute? So i, j is this operator k. And the reason we're doing a commuting, we're going to say, if a commutes with i, j, then we're going to have it be in that subgroup, OK? And those things will retain that property. That's something to check. I won't check. But uh, if it doesn't commute, then we're leaving it out. 
And then that will be part of the quotient, the symmetric space. So if you're into that part of it, that's also interesting. So um, let's say that uh, we have a vector, v, little v plus, which is in the big V plus, in the vector space V plus. Then what do we know? Well, and let's say that this is com commuting, right? Then I times capital J of times A V plus, well, if it's commuting, then we can switch these around, right? So A times I J V plus. But what do we know about I J V plus? Well, we know what the eigenvalue is. And so that's just plus one. So this just becomes V plus, And so you get A V plus. And then here's the conclusion we have to make. Well, I J, you know, A V plus is a vector. What do we know about that vector? We know that if you act on it with ij, then that vector av plus is going to be sent to av plus itself. Okay, so ij sends av plus to av plus. Well, that means that av plus um, has an eigenvalue plus one here, right? as it's an, it's an eigenvector of ij. And so that means that it belongs to v plus. And similarly, if v minus is element of v minus, and if you act on that with ij and you assume that they commute, well, then you see, okay, ij times v minus is gonna be negative v minus. Negative just uh, commutes across. And so now it's taking, this operator is taking a v minus and giving you minus a v minus. So what does that say about a v minus? That implies that, um, Oh, I got my. This is this is not good. <laughs> I messed up my notation. That implies that oh, a v minus is in v minus. Okay, there's no such thing as a v here. I'm sorry for that. A v plus is element of v plus. A v minus is element of v minus. What's the point? The point is that um, a, which was in u of two n, has these constraints on it. It's sending um, things that are in V plus to V plus. And it's sending vectors that are in V minus to V minus. So it's respecting to, it's not crossing, cross, you know, it's not doing any kind of cross connections. So it's an element of U of N cross U of N. Okay. And so there's more to prove here. I guess you have to prove that it's, we're getting all of these, et cetera, et cetera. But this is how you kind of think through that, okay, well, u of n cross u of n is embedded in u of 2n, okay? And so um, that was a little thing I wanted to show. Uh, and now, uh, though, you can have this happen in another way. So uh, we were relying on this complex number i, but suppose you don't allow for these scalars i. That's going to be the real bot periodicity, okay? We don't allow for that. We're dealing with real numbers and matrices with real numbers. So um, we can look, if we have three of these operators, J1, J2, J3, where basically in their own bases, they all look like this, but their bases are, their natural bases are all different. So they don't look that way to each other, let's say. And so then um, J1 times J2, will be negative J2, J1. Uh, if we assume that they're all mutually anti-commuting, then this is, I'm just writing out what that means. It means that this anti-commutes here, these two anti-commute and these two anti-commute. So if we have all these assumptions, um, and these are the kinds of, this is kind of like the assumptions for a Clifford algebra, uh, that uh, you have this kind of anti-commutation. And uh, in our case, uh, they're squaring to negative one. So it's a Clifford algebra where the generators are squaring to negative one. Now let's look at what happens when we have this, we could call it like a, they call it a pseudo scalar, okay? But it's it's three um, operators um, multiplied together to give you an operator K, okay? We multiply them all together. What happens if we square that? Will we get positive one? Well, we know what to do. We know how to swap their positions, okay? So if we take the J1 and move it across twice, well, each time we move it across once, it gives you a minus sign. If you move it across twice, that's a minus sign. Twice, that's a plus, plus sign. So we get this here. And then if we move the J2 once over, 
then that'll be a minus sign. And then j1 squared, j2 squared, j3 squared, those are all going to give us minus signs. So we have minus times minus times minus times minus, and that's a plus, plus 1. So that it does give us a plus 1. And so this very similar argument follows through. And this will follow through in the case now we're dealing with these real matrices. And so in that uh, chain of embedding, that explains why like O2, O of 2n is... Um, has within it the subgroup uh, O of n cross O of n, and why SP of 2n has within it the subgroup SP of n cross SP of n, okay? And so if you look back up here in this long chain, you see that's why when we get to here, the first we introduce a J1, and that takes us, that allows us to say, okay, we had the orthogonals, but we're going to focus on the unitary subgroup. And then we do a J2, which is mutually anti-commuting. And then let's focus on the complex symplectic subgroup. And then when we have the third one, then we can use this argument to conclude, you know, now we can demonstrate that that vector space actually splits and that uh, uh, it's possible, you know, that there's this subgroup living in there, inhabiting there, happy in there, that is actually splitting. And if you keep going, keep going, keep going, then at a certain point, you can make that same argument. When you get to O2R, you can make the same argument that this is there, this is there. Okay. So that's important for that. Um, and there's more to it than just this, because uh, what you'll notice too is like, well, could we have, like, why can't we just um, go from, you know, have a symplectic sequence that goes SP, uh, for R, SP, 2R, cross SP, 2R, SP, 2R, and then go, okay, SP, R, cross SP, R, SP, R. In a certain sense, you can do that. There is an embedding like that. But um, it's not, you would basically have to um, reframe this whole question, pursue it differently. Like what's kind of cool about this one is that we just start here and then we just keep adding these linear complex structures and we're having them all mutually anti-commuting, okay? Uh, so if you keep doing that, I think the deal is, is that, uh, I have to be careful about this. You wouldn't get, you know, well, so you don't get SP, you get, if you keep doing that, you get U of 2R. Now, if you don't assume that they're all mutually anti-commuting like that, well, the problem is, is that where, you know, you need to get these three, um, you need to get these, you need to show that there is a way, there's an operator that will split this SP2R. So the way we did it, we had these three anti-commuting operators. Um, you need to, and you, you need to give up on these other conditions, you know, you need to not worry that they're mutually anti-commuting with stuff we had before. So basically, it's just a different circumstance. So this is just things I worry about, think about trying to get and gain intuition. So if that's what I'm sharing with you. Um, then um, a point I just want to maybe uh, conclude with is that, you see, we had to wait until we had three of them to square to negative one because J1 by itself squares to negative one. What happens if we have J1, J2, and we square that? Well, what will happen is that uh, you take the J1, you move it across. Okay, so you get negative sign from that, but you have negative times J1 squared times J2 squared, and that equals uh, negative times negative times negative, and that's negative one. So that's not positive one. So that won't give us the K we want uh, at this point. And so um, uh, that does give you uh, something that looks, you know, that, that is the quaternions, because if you identify J1 with uh, the quaternion I and you identify J2 with the quaternion J, well, I times J is going to be K, and K squares to negative 1, just like it does here. And then that all works out. This becomes, uh, this can be shown to be isomorphic to the quaternions. So this is the world I live in. <laughs> uh learning about delving into these uh, uh, into these uh, Lie group embeddings, and maybe just to have a bit of philosophical uptake on what this all means, ultimately. Um, I think what it means, it's about whether or not we 
are having a mind, so to speak. And then if we do have minds, we have like three minds. And uh, what is the kind of related type of knowledge? So what I believe is happening and that this is modeling is that you can think of knowledge as just raw experience, okay? Um, and there's like a first mind, so to speak, that says, okay, it's the mind that knows the answers. But there's a second mind that doesn't know but asks the questions. So it's like there's the unconscious, there's the conscious, and there's consciousness which links those two and relates those two, okay? So the first mind is kind of like unreflected. The second mind is like reflected or contextual. And the third mind says that they're equal, but then you get to choose which one you'd like to use. So um, when we do the first mind, um, that'll be this first thing here. That's like a, uh, that can be modeled, like let's say with a, um, well, this linear complex structure. And then if we do a second, you know, if we do the second, introduce the second mind, you can model that with a quaternionic structure. But if you put the third mind, you get this uh, split by quaternionic structure. So the quaternions, if you have two of them, let's say, and they're related, they're they're basically, you know, you have like a direct sum of quaternions, the two copies of the quaternions. That's like a bi-split quaternion. And those are like the two minds being equated by consciousness. Okay, you have an original mind and you have like a reflected mind and then they're being related. So that's one way to think about it. And the other thing to think about is that like, there's this process where you have, let's say, knowledge, just, just raw. But then you have this I, attitude to say, well, I'm not interested in phony knowledge. Okay, so let's say this is all knowledge, but some of this is maybe just opinions, you know, uh, made-up concepts or, or not made-up concepts, but just conceptual thinking, you know. That's not what I want to lean on, you know, if I really want evidence. You know, I don't want secondhand knowledge, so to speak. I just want firsthand raw experience. So you throw that out. And then you have not just raw experience, but you have knowledge that has a testimony. This Someone is actually experienced it, right? And then you could say, yeah, but maybe they just experienced their own feelings, right? <laughs> or like their own little prejudices or their opinions or whatever. I don't want to have like, or they're just getting something from somewhere else. I want to see like, what is that coming from? You know, like, what's the, what's the source of that? Uh, so that would be like the, the knowledge that they know. OK, and so that's kind of like explicit knowledge if you go that deep. And so those three letters, like the first layer, raw experience, I think like the orthogonals are just modeling that. The unitary is modeling like the testifiers, the ones who give the experience. And the symplectic goes deeper and talks about actually knowledge, like what's the knowledge that fed into these people? And so uh, it turns out, and I'll do another video, I hope, like where you look at the dimensions, like if you look at the mission, you can kind of see like the whole thing is kind of off kilter. Okay. And so you get this kind of off kilter whole development where it goes all the way around and all the round around to do all these consequences. And then it collapses after eight things. You kind of get back to where you started. That's the interesting thing I'm trying to understand the model. But what this one is, and that's basically like if you're thinking of people in terms of minds, a person is just a mind, right? And it turns out actually that mind is composed of minds. And that's based on the evidence that we have of these internal tensions that we have, you know, these conflicts that we have within our minds, saying there's these different, there's different things that we're trying to put together to be coherent. Uh, so whether it's like the neurons that we have that are enmeshed in the world or whether it is the conceptual language that's divorced from the world, but that we, you know, the variables, the slots that we use to think about the world. So the difference between the answers we're experiencing and the questions we're asking and then, then uh, claiming there's a third mind that relates to. So what this is saying is that you can relate to people not by just their minds. But you can relate to people as beings that you respect for, uh, you take at face value just for who they are, okay? So it's like you have a spirit beyond system, which I would call God, and that spirit goes beyond itself into itself into a system through us. So we're in system and we experience, but we have like a spirit that comes beyond us. And then the spirit in us can go beyond outside into beyond the system into God or like to 
engage other people in a godly way, you know, just in terms of a, as if they're, you know, the spirit in us leaping to the spirit in them and back, back, hopping back and forth, etc., or being one with each other in, in this deep dialogue, maybe like I am trying to be with you. So that type of uh, connection in the being, you see, there's no mind there. And when I do the dimensional analysis, you'll see like, it's all quadratic. There's no little linear term. Whereas like in the case of the, uh, orthogonal uh, matrices or the symplectic matrices, there's a linear term. Maybe I can give you just a little uh, sneak preview of that, uh, but probably not. Uh, I'm going to do it. Let's just go. Uh, we're going to sneak in here. This because this is what I was going to make a video about, and I thought, well, I first have to talk about these things for some reason. But you see, if you look at the formulas for Lie group, uh, the U of R is R squared, okay? But for O of R, you get a one half R squared minus one half R. And for SP of R, you get a plus, you know, linear term. And so these linear terms are just kind of like, uh, they're just off kilter. Here, it's just uh, very uh, nicely embedded in each other, okay? So that's something to, to work on. Uh, and the, the gist is, is that when you look at like the definition of orthogonal matrix and how it relates to its transpose and what, what it means for vectors to be orthonormal, you will see that you get two times of equations for things on the upper triagonal matrix. But on the diagonal, you don't get uh, two. You just get one source of information. So it's the relationship between self connect relationship and relationship between two others. It turns out in the unitary case, they're properly balanced because you have two self-relations with yourself. In the real case, you only have one case, one self-relation. In the quaternion case, you have four self-relations. But what you want, you want two self-relations with yourself. That's a subject for another video. Thank you for being with me, for thinking along with me. Um, and I'm just uh, glad to share. Peace and love. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm a Patreon supporter for Math for Wisdom because Andres and I have been friends for a long time, most of our lives. And the conversations I've had with him over the years have been very useful for me. Uh, he's also a big, big fan, my supporter, you know, of my work. And um, we just, we have deep conversations about math and physics that have been useful for charting the course of my interests. And, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful and, you know, I, I want to support that and, you know, our weekly or by you know semi-weekly or bi-weekly conversations have been have been um, very important for me in the last couple of years, especially. So yeah, that's why I'm a supporter.